So today I'm going to be discussing some of our work looking at using second order texture on predicting lung cancer recurrence after stereotactic radiotherapy. So I just want to start off by acknowledging my supervisors, lab members, and our collaborators in the Netherlands who provided us with all the images used in this study, as well as the sources of funding which have generously supported this work. Lung cancer remains the leading cause of cancer death in Canada, and in the early stage, non-small cell lung cancer is traditionally treated with surgery. However, this can be both an invasive and risky procedure. And with new technical advancements, we now have alternative treatment options to treat these patients. Stereotactic ablative radiotherapy, or SABER, is becoming the standard treatment option for patients with early stage, non-small cell lung cancer who are considered medically inoperable or refuse surgery. SABER uses advanced treatment planning and delivery to treat the tumor to a high dose while sparing surrounding normal tissue. As you can see in this dose distribution in which each color represents a different dose to the tissue, the red high dose region is wrapped tightly around the target, receiving about 60 gray, whereas the surrounding normal tissue receives less than 20 gray. SABER also uses higher doses and fewer fractions. So in conventional techniques, patients are receiving the 60 gray and 30 fractions, but in SABER, they're receiving the same dose in only three, five, or eight fractions. This allows SABERs to achieve local control rates similar to surgery of over 90% at three years. However, after any type of radiotherapy to the lungs, radiation-induced lung injury can occur as radiation pneumonitis and radiation fibrosis, which appear as radiographic changes on CT. Following conventional radiotherapy techniques, such as the example seen on the left, where the patient would have received one beam coming in from the front and one beam coming in from the back, the straight dose distribution produces a straight line. The resultant radiation-induced lung injury also follows this straight line and is easily distinguished. However, the changes we see after SABER are quite different. In general, they can be subdivided into the acute and late phase. And what to get out of this is that they can come in many different types of patterns, all geometrically different. And if we focus in on this mass-like change, it can become very difficult in being able to tell, is this just an injury or is it a recurrence? So to illustrate this with an example, I have two patients from our study, one on the top row and one on the bottom. The zero month indicates the tumor prior to treatment, and then we have three and six month follow-up scans. So as you can see, it's very hard to put a distinct size measure on any of these changes. However, the appearance of these two look quite different. And it's not until at about 12 months post-treatment we see an enlarging solid mass, and we know this patient has a recurrence and the bottom has an injury. But ideally, we'd like to be able to detect this at these earlier time points to permit salvage, timely salvage treatment. So to further illustrate the difficulty, this is a patient who was published in the literature who underwent SABER and by nine months had an enlarging solid mass, suspicious for recurrence. Underwent surgical resection to have pathology show a benign fibrotic scar. So there's two main problems with misclassification. Is if you misclassify as a recurrence, patients are undergoing unnecessary surgery for only benign disease. And second, if you misclassify as an injury, patients may miss the opportunity for salvage treatment. So what techniques do we currently have to assess response post saber Well, the current clinical standard is RESYST, or Response Evaluation Criteria in Solid Tumors. This is where the physician measures the longest axial diameter of the tumor pre- and post-treatment to determine treatment response. FDG-PET and biopsy can also be used, however hypermetabolic activity is seen in benign SABER-treated lung even up to two years post-treatment, and the risks associated with biopsy prevent it from being used as a first-line tool for diagnosis. Therefore, what's critically needed is a reliable measure of recurrence on CT imaging as the utilization of SABER is rapidly increasing, and since CT scanning is the standard measure of imaging follow-up for these patients. So based on our observation that the appearance of these changes looks different, the objective of our study is to measure the utility and predictive power of appearance measures taken within six months of treatment for predicting which patients will ultimately have a diagnosis of recurrence. We hypothesize that first and second order texture measures can predict recurrence in individual patients more accurately than traditional measures of size on the first follow-up scan. We looked at 22 patients treated with SABER with a total of 24 lesions, 11 with recurrence and 13 without and analyzed 46 scans taken at approximately three or six months post-treatment. What we did was we manually contoured any observable lung changes on all follow-up CTs, and we contoured two regions of interest as shown here by the solid and dashed lines. And if we just zoom in on one of these examples, we can see our region of interest in more detail. So the first is our consolidation region, defined as any dense mass without visible vessels beneath. And our second is our ground glass opacity, or GGO, indicated by the dashed line, 
to find is an increase in lung density when compared to normal while still being able to visualize the vasculature beneath. So within both of these regions, we calculated two size measures, 3D volume and the longest axial diameter, as well as one first order texture measure and seven second order texture features. So the first order texture measure is just the standard deviation within a, a region of interest. And this assesses the global variation of densities within a region. So in general, as even more variegated texture, the standard deviation increases. However, this isn't always the case. And in these three examples, you can see we have distinct patterns. However, the standard deviation remains quite consistent. This is because first order texture does not considering the neighboring voxel relationships. So to illustrate this with a very artificial example, we could say I have one large vessel going to multiple smaller vessels. The standard deviation is identical because all three images have the exact same number of white and black pixels. The only thing that's different is their spatial location. So second order texture statistics can take into account this neighboring voxel relationship. So how do we calculate, how are second order texture features calculated? I'm gonna give a quick example using an artificial image divided into pixels. Each pixel has a corresponding image intensity, in our case a binary image, so either zeros or ones. When we calculate second order texture, we always have a reference pixel and a neighbor pixel. And in our case, the neighbor pixel is one to the right, but it could be in any direction. So we calculate second order texture using a gray level co-occurrence matrix, which is just a tabulation of how often pixel pairs occur within an image. So on one axis, we have the reference pixel value, and on the other, the neighbor pixel value, and then the total tabulation of how often that pixel pair occurs. So in our example, we look up our reference pixel, our neighbor pixel, find the corresponding spot, and add one as it has occurred once. So we can do this for every pixel as the reference pixel in the first row and update the GLCM accordingly. And then we can complete this for the entire image and we have a final GLCM. So just to con contrast this with one of our other examples, I just have another image sample with a different GLCM. We can see that's produced. And from this, we can calculate several different texture features. So we'll just look at energy, which is just the sum of squares of the GLCM. So before we calculate this, we must normalize the GLCM to account for the total number of pixel pairs. So we normalize it so they add to one, and since energy is just the sum of squares, we're gonna square it, and then we'll sum it. And this gives us our final energy value. So recall that although these two images had the exact same first order texture or standard deviation, they can be better differentiated by the second order texture feature. So we calculated seven order second order features based on the Carnos, Harlow, and Trevetti texture feature set well established in the literature. We also wanted to study the utility of these measures for predicting recurrence, so we use classification using a linear classifier, as well as leave one out and two-fold cross-validation. We analyzed our scans within two discrete time points from two to five months and five to eight months, corresponding to the approximately three and six month scheduled clinically, clinically scheduled follow-up scan. So onto our results, interestingly enough, our top five features out of all possible features with the lowest two-fold cross-validation error were all texture features within the ground glass. So just to recall, the ground glass is this region, dash region surrounding the solid. We observed errors on the order of 23 to 29%, and with the AUC's also, area under the op receiver operating curve values also shown, and interestingly enough, as we move to the six-month time point, we see some er errors uh, remain the same or get slightly better, but some do worse. So we found that energy and entropy were our top two features, so we'll look at those in a little bit more detail. Here I have all patients plotted by their energy value on the y-axis and their entropy value on the x-axis. All patients in yellow are those with recurrence, and blue are those with injury. So you can see here the groups are well separated, and we have our overall accuracies of 77%, and leave one out accuracies of actually over 80%. If we contrast this with any size measure at the exact same time point, using volume and recessed or the longest axial diameter, we can see the groups are not well separated and overall errors on the order, or accuracies on the order of 60% can only be achieved. So going back to our image sample here where we have one large vessel going to many smaller vessels with a similar standard deviation, we can see that the energy values in these examples energy value decreases and entropy values increases um, in these three examples. But what does this mean for the visual appearance of the GGO in our patients? So we'll look here at one recurrence patient with a high en entropy and low energy value. We can see that the ground glass has these highly contrast speculations coming out from the solid. If we look at an injury patient on the other spectrum with a lower entropy and higher energy, we see a much more smoother appearance to the GGO. And if we look at two patients on the boundary, we can see we have some speculations and a mix between the two. 
So our classifier would have a harder time distinguishing these patients. So on the basis that our most predictive features were all within the ground glass opacity region, or this green region here, and due to the manually contouring these regions is very time consuming and difficult due to the ill-defined border, we also want to look at if we could only use the consolidation region and automatically expand this out at different radius to act as a GGO surrogate. And in the interest of time, I won't go into all the details from this study, but overall, with distances about one and a half to two centimeters from the solid, uh, showed excellent reproducibility with the manual GGO contours within about 5% error. So in conclusion, we've shown that second order texture features can achieve leave one out cross validation accuracies of over 81% compared to any size measure at the same time point, which could only achieve accuracies of 60%. And we've also shown that automatic expansion of the consolidation shows excellent reproducibility, potentially in eliminating the need for manual GGO delineation. We're currently working on validating all results on a larger data set, and we hope to make a clinical translation to a useful tool which could potentially allow for earlier salvage of patients with recurrence and result in fewer investigations of patients exhibiting only benign injury.